Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and on this episode of the podcast is all about steep running and hiking and how to make the most out of your efforts out there on the trails. Every single week, I have athletes ask me, how do I become a better uphill runner and when do I switch between running and hiking? And is one of the most common questions in trail and ultra running and one that we've also discussed on the podcast before, but we can never learn enough about this subject. So on the podcast today, I have the esteemed Roger Crom, PhD and Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado Boulder. Professor Crom's contributions to the biomechanics community would take a whole lifetime's worth of podcasts to actually discuss, and I'm very honored that he would at least sit down with me for one single podcast to discuss some of these topics. He has contributed immensely to our understanding of running biomechanics, the oxygen and energy cost of running, and how biomechanics affect human performance. Roger has built a legacy that will extend far beyond his teaching years by not only helping to pioneer the field of biomechanics itself even before that field existed, but with the University of Colorado's Biomechanics Lab, which is one of the most sought after laboratories in the entire world for biomechanics research. Roger is also a paid consultant to Nike and contributed greatly to their Breaking Two project, providing important research and counsel on the effort. And in the show notes, I will link to a few of the papers that Roger was recently involved in that assisted in that particular effort. However, most importantly for trail and ultra running, Roger's biomechanics lab built a steep treadmill that goes up to a 100% grade, which is kind of unfathomable for most runners. And they did that in order to study uphill running after being inspired by none other than the incomparable Killian Jornet. As a personal note, I took some undergraduate courses from Roger and he provided some technical advisement to the first edition of my book, which I am forever grateful for. You'll appreciate Roger's expertise, his passion for the sport, and his passion for performance, as well as how he can communicate complex topics in an understandable way. All right, I'm going to get right out of the way. Let's get right into it. Here's my conversation with the incredible Roger Crom. How's a semi-retired or retired life been treating you before we get good. into it? Good, really good. Yeah, I, uh, um, I've been getting out on more skiing and uh uh but i took on another project of uh my wife and i bought a a, a new house so uh we're uh renovating that and overseeing that so uh i guess <clears throat> but yeah life's good I, I i feel like i can keep up with things you know it's like oh well i can do that later this week and and then i actually get it done later this week instead <laughs> of like just disappearing uh into oblivion so well, yeah. you were busy throughout the course of your career. I mean, not only were you teaching, but you already, you had like a graduate, you know, student army, it seemed like, like pumping out publications right. and then the lab and then your consulting work with Nike all on top of that. I mean, I can imagine how projects can get shoved to years down the years down the road with all that going on. Yeah, actually I have a, I have the big one that, uh, I hope to take on, uh, is, uh, writing a book. So, uh, you know, some form of a book, I don't know if it- It'll be a, a book book or a ebook or a, but uh yeah. Sign me up for the newsletter when it when it releases because I'll All be right. first uh, I'll be first on the list to buy it. You're the second or third podcast guest that I've had in the last month that's work that has is it is working on a book or has it kind of like in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I want to write to uh I write it for my 18 year old self, like some <laughs> a, a kid who likes to run, who likes science and like uh, you know, and, and then the whole world opens up. It's like, whoa, I can do this for a career. Wow. This is pretty cool. So I, I like the fact that you have tracked your mile PR for how many years now <laughs> in the bio that you sent me that I read right before this, how many years, not to yeah. yourself, Roger, but I think we're past pretentiousness. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm 59. So it's, uh, and I ran my fastest mile when I was 18. So yeah, it's what 41 years. So, wow. uh, yeah, I, I, I don't track it every year. I just was like, huh, I wonder how much I've slowed down. And then I figured it out and it's, it's kind of, 
it's maybe a good lesson for your listeners actually. And that is that you, if you don't use something, you do lose it. And, and it's, it's inexorably slowly and small, you know, like, like a hundredth of a second every day, I slow down in a mile and, and, you know, you're like, well, where did it go? What did I do? It's, it's not what you did. It's what you didn't do. And that's maintain speed work and, and, you know, turnover and, and, uh, I think that's the main thing. I mean, you have this, you have this like really long academic career that kind of started with running, right? I mean, you're a runner in high school and you, you, you know, you've mentioned to me in class and also in your bio that you kind of take your, you took your first lactate measurements, you know, as a a teenager (laughs) in your mom's laundry room and things like that. So you've always been interested in locomotion, I guess is what I'm saying. And not just human locomotion, but also animal locomotion of which you've researched a ton, correct? Right. Yeah, that was what uh, really all I did before I, uh, well, mostly what I did before I came to Colorado. So um, yeah, I've studied a, a wide variety of animals. So I, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, Saturdays was, uh, they had these classes, sort of extra classes at the Natural History Museum. And, uh, and we had a great zoo. So uh, yeah, I've been fascinated with animals. It, it was really hard for me to choose when I went to college which science to study because I love mechanics and I love biology and uh, I did really well in chemistry and, uh, and biomechanics as a word and as a field really was just just ba- barely beginning. So it, was, it wasn't like I could major in biomechanics. That wasn't a thing. <laughs> and uh, but I, I guess I tended tended more to the uh, once we got out of physics mechanics once we got went into you know quantum and relativity and stuff I I kind of like lost interest it wasn't any it wasn't real for me I loved mechanics and then so then I drifted more to biology and physiology which is obviously pretty real and uh, we all experience so. And, and more recently, and more more recently for you is like the last twenty years. I, I'm uh, by my calculations. Yeah. Um, there's been a really heavy run focus on things, and yeah. you, you, yeah, yeah, goes without saying. You and your lab have have had your fingers in like a number of different pies in the running community from footwear to running economy to uh, i mean i had uh, alina grabowski on my podcast a few weeks ago talking about prosthetics and 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 run performance and she's fantastic and and now most recently since this is primarily a trail and ultra running podcast you have this Mm -hmm. steep treadmill in your lab this one-of-a-kind steep treadmill that if anybody were to have ever, were to ever seen it, they would look at it and go, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that this is like a training tool, but it's something that you, that you and you and your colleagues in your lab, you guys built, right? You guys built this, this steep treadmill specifically for the purposes of research. And so I think to start to paint the picture, like describe the treadmill for us. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, the, the cutting edge of science, you, often have to build your own tools. Like they just don't exist. If you wanted to, um, you know, at the crazy extreme, if you want to study the atom, you need to make a particle collider, right? And those are a little bigger scale than making a treadmill. But um, the steepest treadmill you can find is I think made by um, Nordic track, yeah. a commercial one. Yep. And uh, and most of the gyms or, or home, home treadmills measure things in percent. Uh, percent grade, but uh, that gets kind of, it gets like a weird number. So we go with uh, degrees because 45 degrees is a hundred percent by the way grade is calculated. And and that uh, everybody's like, what do you mean a hundred percent? Like straight up? I'm like, no, no, not ha- straight up. So, so anyhow, uh, there's a little bit, it may be an interesting story for your crowd. And that is that um, uh, Killian Journey was giving a lecture at the Boulder Running Company and, uh, and Alina Grabowski and I went to, to hear him and, uh, and it was very, you know, I don't know if you've heard him or met him, but he's, yeah. he's contagious, you know, he's, yeah. he's, he's a really intriguing guy. And, uh, and I elbowed Alina. I said, you know, we really ought to study this trail running stuff. Cause we, she and I run together and, and, uh, and we had, uh, we had never done anything specifically for really uh, for trail or steep stuff. So 
Um, and we had uh, we had a, a, an old treadmill that we had made ourselves um, because we uh, my lab but uh, we made the first force measuring treadmill a treadmill that uh, you can measure the, the ground reaction force underneath the feet with every step and uh, we had to make this treadmill super light and pretty small so uh, so we had that around and uh, we have this stuff called 80 not 80 20 we have it. Uh, it's unistrut. It's the stuff that it's the metal uh, metal tubing that holds up stop signs or, or no parking signs. Everybody's kind of familiar with it, but it turns out it's a great um, Lego for for big kids, and uh, we use it all the time. We can make things very quickly and bolt it together and make a frame. So that's what we we made a frame that uh, we could uh, lift and then bolt in place at whatever angle we wanted. It it goes to well, it could go to 90 if you wanted to. Um, it could overhang, but but we're not doing the, uh, climbing locomotion right now. Um, and uh, oh, I should give credit. One of the students who worked on that was uh, Mandy Ortiz, who um, was a University of Colorado student, but um, more relevant, she was on the uh, United States mountain running team. I think she was junior. Yeah, she may have been world champion as a junior. Uh, and her mom's a pretty famous uh, ultra runner too. She's won Pikes Peak like some crazy number of times. And yeah. she's, I don't want to guess her age, but she, you know, her daughter's in med school. So she's, she's, uh, <laughs> she's a pretty impressive lady. Um, anyhow, Mandy, Mandy and I put that together. We, we made this frame out of, uh, uh, 80, 20, uh of, uh, Unistrut and, uh, uh, we started to run into a couple of problems. I, I guess I'm start. I started to realize why commercial treadmills only go to a certain uh, degree, <laughs> and, and and that is uh, first one was uh, was friction. Uh, so when it gets too steep, your feet are slipping, and so we had to put um, uh, adhesive sandpaper on it. Uh, I had another student, uh, Brian Pham, who's a longboarder, and he said, "Oh, you want this stuff called vicious tape, which is." <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really sticky and really aggressive sandpaper. And we put that on the treadmill so that we wouldn't what, slip. What you're describing is this people like literally their foot is slipping oh, yeah. down off of the treadmill because of the incline. Exactly. So you're yeah. basically putting grippy sandpaper on the bottom of it or yeah. on the belt. Yeah. Yeah. You you couldn't you you couldn't <laughs> go at the angle. And and then then the second thing we noticed. Uh, after we weren't slipping was that at, at steeper angles, the, um, your body weight is pulling the, the belt backwards, right? As you, as you step on this thing and the motor on a treadmill is designed to make it go. It's not designed to slow it down. And so, um, we realized we had to put a load on the treadmill on the motor. And so we have, a um, an extra like belt pulley and we hang weights, uh, over the over the uh, belt pulley so that uh, the motor has something that to work against and it can maintain a constant speed so um before any of your listeners say oh i want to make a super steep treadmill um <laughs> you, you yeah sure you can put sticky tape on it or sticky sandpaper that's safe but um if you take a regular treadmill and you incline it too steeply um the, you'll ruin the motor the motor will uh will well, it, it, it just won't work. So uh, it, you have to figure out a way to provide a resistance to the, uh, to the, to the motor if you, if you do want to try this. So don't DIY it unless you have a biomechanics team behind you assisting yeah. you with the process. Is the, yeah. Is the or, uh, I, yeah, but I don't want to discourage DIY. Uh, uh, um, Nicola Giovanelli, who was the second student to work on the project, um, who, who you should have on your podcast, he'd be great. Um, Nicola, um, he bought a treadmill off of eBay in Italy for like, uh, 50 euros and, and he modified that one. So, uh, you can, you can get, you know, just don't take your brand new January 1st Christmas present, uh, $5,000 treadmill and try it, uh, get, get a cheap treadmill and, and, uh, and try to modify it. Sure. <laughs> I, I actually did have Nicola on my, uh, on my podcast as episode 61 for the listeners. Oh, good. And he's, fin he's fantastic. We geeked out on polls as you can, as you can imagine, but yeah. what you're telling me, I did not know the origin of this story. Yeah. Um, as many conversations as you, as you and I have had, uh, 
Killian being the, <laughs> the, the, the origin of the yeah. Steve treadmill. You are literally going to a presentation by Killian Jornet. Of course it's Killian, right? right. Older out of all things. Yes. And you decide that you're going to start studying trail running. And one of the mechanisms you needed to study trail running was a treadmill that exceeded the, the capacity or the capabilities of the current treadmills that were out there. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I really got, got hooked on the vertical kilometer and, and that, um, uh, which, which is really not, well, it, it, they seem to be held in conjunction with ultra races, but, um, it's a, it's a totally different energy system and uh, yeah, but, but it's, you know, I, I've been a scientist. Well, I guess I've always been a scientist, really. Children are scientists too. And, uh, um, you know, the idea that it's a kilometer, like, oh yeah, a thousand meters, every, you know, that, that's right. a nice, uh, it, it, nice metric for, uh, and, uh, um, and that there are different places in the world where, that are better or worse. And, and, you know, you said it was been about 20 years since I really focused on running. And that's when I moved to Boulder to the university of Colorado. And, uh, and it was certainly an attractive aspect of it that, that I knew I'd have really good subjects and, um, and, but more so that in my personal life, I could be in the mountains and you can't, you can't really live here and run without thinking about uphill. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's inevitable, right? You know, it, it's the challenge, it's the beauty. And, um, uh, so, so we have done a whole series of studies on uphill running. And I appreciate the way that you have approached the problem because when I first started working with trail and ultra runners, a lot of the practice that we used, a lot of what we were doing with trail and ultra runners was extrapolated from research that was done in the traditional endurance domains and particularly like the 10 kilometer and, and the marathon. Mm -hmm. But the way that your, your lab kind of approaches, like, let's just understand what the cost of transport is. Let's understand these very basic biomechanical concepts of uphill and downhill running and then see if we can translate and then and then i could take that as a coach i could take those things and try to translate it into training prescriptions and one of the things that you first kind of started out with was let's just find the most i'm going to use the word efficient and it's probably a bastardized way to 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 use it for bomb talking to a biomechanist right. here but what's the most efficient way to climb a certain distance like what grade is the best one to pick if you had a number of different choices and you guys use the steep treadmill in this uh in this research yeah absolutely so so uh this is something that everybody thinks about uh, well not if you're if you stick on the trails but if you run kind of off trail and and other animals think about they don't know if they think about it but they they act upon it is uh, what's the best angle to go up this hill? Should I go straight up this hill? Should I, uh, and, and it's, it's probably a lot up here, different personalities. Um, init your initial guest is like, let's just get it over with and go straight up the fall <laughs> line. Right? Um, and then other people are more methodical and say like, no, I'll zigzag up and, um, and, uh, and, and maintain a, may maybe I should maintain an angle that I can run at rather than taking it so steep that I have to climb or walk up it. And, um, it was pretty abstract. Um, but, but a, a scientist named Alberto Minetti had looked at, uh, and I think he had done it. He looked at more, uh, the trails in Europe for where people use donkeys and horses and so on. And they have a certain incline. They, they, they all kind of converged on, Hey, this is the best incline for, uh, uh hauling stuff up to our mountain hut with a, with a donkey. Um, and other scientists, biologists have looked at, um, I, I've been thinking about following up on this. Uh, they looked at tracks uh, on, uh, presumably in the snow uh, that, that animals take up a hill, right? Do they, uh, do they go up, do small animals go up a different angle? Do big animals go up straight up the hill? Anyhow, there's still plenty of questions to, to pursue there in a more biological setting. But, but um, yeah, Nicola and uh, uh, Mandy Ortiz and I, uh, we, we started looking at, I said, this vertical kilometer thing has got me. I'm, I'm really curious about it, you know? And, <laughs> and, 
and uh, and what's the record? And and then you find the record is was at that time was just under thirty minutes. Right. And um, I'm like, wow, a thousand takes 30, 30 minutes to go a kilometer. You know, I can do a kilometer and you know under four minutes on the uh, on a flat ground. Many many of your runners can do it and much faster, but it takes half an hour. So um, and then we looked at the angle of uh, that. The records all seem to be set at uh, at Fully in Switzerland, and and it's an old uh, f- what they call a funicular, a, a cog railway uh, line that was abandoned, and and it's at 30 degrees. The average incline is 30 degrees. I'm like 30 degrees. I love 30 degrees. It's you know the sine of 30 cosine of 30 everybody knows this triangle 30 60 90 triangle so it's like 30 degrees yeah and and at first 30 degrees doesn't seem like that steep when you draw it on a piece of paper but when you incline your treadmill to 30 degrees remember that's 50 percent that's not uh it's not 30 percent it's it's 50 percent it's 30 degrees so that's the that's where the record was and we looked at other vks um uh, around the world and found that uh, the, they were slower. If there weren't really any that there's maybe one, I think in Italy, that's slightly steeper and the records are not set there. And then there's a couple in the Western U S and Canada that are more gradual. So um, yeah. So that study, that was really where we got our feet wet and, and, and we, we had to make some, we had to start somewhere. Right. And, uh, we knew we could vary the angle. We could vary the angle and the speed or we decided we settled. Nicola was only here for six months. So we had to settle on something that was right. doable uh, because of his visa. And, uh, and I said, well, let's set a vertical rate of ascent, which you guys use all the time, I'm sure. And, and we set a, a vertical rate of ascent that, that Mandy and, and, and Nicola felt that we could have people sustain and uh, and then we match the vertical rate of ascent at different angles. So, of course, at at five degrees, you got to run pretty fast to do this vertical rate of ascent. And at thirty degrees and thirty five, I think we went to forty degrees in that study, or close to it. So steep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to just to like a lot of people have forgotten <clears throat> high school geometry right now. Yeah. So the I'm going to take a like a real a real world example that. Sure. That a lot of listeners will will be familiar with, and Roger, you probably are familiar with having uh, lived in in the area for so long. The backside of Hope Pass on the Leadville Trail 100, which is the hardest part of the course, mm-hmm. is about a, at a 10 degree angle. Yeah. And you not were the, putting not, people not 30 degrees, not 40 <laughs> degrees, 10 degrees, and everybody thinks that's really steep, and it is. It absolutely yeah. is. It absolutely is really steep. And if you look at any other normal trail setting, Devil's Thumb is probably like, I'm going to do the math in my head right now, probably about 8% or something, or sorry, not 8%, 8 degrees. Mm -hmm. You're studying people on slopes that are far steeper than any normal (laughs) North American. I'm going to caveat that. Any normal North American trail. You go over to Europe, it's different because trails construction there is totally different. But you're looking on things at this treadmill that it's it's almost hard to comprehend because, especially for a North, a North American trail runner, because they just don't have that experience of actually actually how steep it is. Yeah, yeah. It if they're skiers, that can help uh, a little bit. Yeah. Because a, I think a a blue a blue run is sort of like twenty degrees ish, and a, and a and a black diamond, a double black diamond, might be thirty degrees. And and if you stand at the top of that on skis. And you're not a really good skier. It's like, whoa, it's, it's yeah. 30, 30 degrees is tough. Okay. So the, the, the origin from Killian Jornet starting or Killian Jornet having a, uh, having a lecture at the Boulder running company and you attending it, you guys started, start to get into trail running. The first question you answer is you want to study things that you want to study locomotion at 30 degrees. I'm going to fast forward a little bit through a few pieces of research and maybe we can kind of summarize it a little bit. One of the things that has started to come out of the lab is this notion of running or locomotion economy is different 
at those steeper grades or steeper angles. So we have this like performance construct in, in a marathon setting. And this is why I mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. where running economy is like this hero. And you have published this uh, most recently with a lot of the sub two hour research. Mm -hmm where one of the things that we are trying to optimize the most in a high performance setting is an athlete's running economy. They're fairly tapped out on their VO2 max. Right. They're fairly tapped out on the fraction of their VO2 max that they can utilize throughout the course of the event. We want to take all of these other different things that impact the cost of running or running economy and see if we can optimize performance in that in that way. You can you can fill in the gaps of that piece because you're in, you're involved a lot in that pro, uh, in that project. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things with, that when we start to move onto the trails and steeper settings is this notion of running economy being like a hero metric to indicate performance is not quite as correlative. And that's right. because the conditions are different. So why don't we start to like go through that a little bit and what your lab has found out about running and or look, and I'm using the word locomotion economy very carefully yeah. <laughs> because I know that sometimes at the steep grades, it's hard to say, is the person actually running? For sure. So, so yeah, we, we, uh, I was involved in the, uh, breaking two and, and the Ineos and, and on a flat, I mean, almost exactly flat, uh, course, uh, running economy, given those other physiological variables are, are pretty fixed. Uh, running economy is something you can, you can play with, you can tweak, you might be able to optimize, get a little marginal gain on. Um, and we assumed that that was the case for, uh, the vertical kilometer that, that what we were trying to figure out was what, what angle of the treadmill gives you this, uh, for a given vertical rate of ascent, which requires the least amount of oxygen, the least low, slowest rate of oxygen consumption, because um, that means you could go a little faster if, if that's an easy uh, rate of oxygen consumption for you. Um, and, and that those data point towards 30 degrees being the, the, uh, the, 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 the optimal angle, if you want to maximize vertical ascent rate and that oxygen consumption is the limiting factor. Okay. So, uh, that those are a couple of assumptions uh, and, but I think it's pretty clear. It's not an assumption in VK or Everesting. The goal is to get the most vert uh, in the shortest period of time. And uh, you know, you, you have to sustain it. You, you can't be over your VO2 max. You can't be too far above threshold for too long. Right. So. Um, Can I just stop you for one second? Yeah. You just earned a whole lot of street cred with the listeners of this podcast by using the word vert. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> so I've been... every, everybody now is like, oh, this guy, he is a trail runner. Cause he used the word yeah. vert as opposed yeah. to some scientific jargon around it. Right. So, <laughs> I think I wanted, it's... To, I wanted to give you some kudos for that. All right. It's partly cause I, uh, I talked to Jackson Brill, uh, uh maybe, uh, <laughs> on a regular basis. He's my, uh, he's my graduate student now. So okay, continue. Roger. <clears throat> that's fine. So, uh, and, and I think Jackson used this recently. He, he did an Everest and he said, uh, he looked, you know, he had read our papers and, and, uh, now he has his own papers, but he said, okay, I should find the steepest, steepest incline I can find if I want to, uh, get my Everest in the shortest period of time. So, um, but the, I, the other, the assumption is that oxygen is limiting in steep uphill locomotion. And th and that's probably not true. Uh, it's not the ultimate thing because, or, or not the only thing I should say. So um, the, the people who are, hold the world record for the 10,000 meters on a track don't hold the world record for the vertical kilometer and vice versa. The, the, the record holder for the vertical kilometer um, is, you know, they're a, a, a fine runner. Uh, uh, but they're, they're not running 26 minutes for, for 10,000 meters on the flat. They have specifically trained a pretty, a, a, I, I've, um, I'm trying to remember the Swiss guy who's the, uh, uh, he raises cow, uh, cows as well. He milks cows. Uh, he held the VK record for a while. Um, as, uh, it's in my paper. Uh, anyhow, maybe it'll come to me. But, but he trains specifically every day after he milks the cows, 
he run, he lives in the mountains. He runs up the mountain and then he runs down the mountain. Then he milks the cows, you know, at the middle of the day or whatever. He, I think he milked cows twice a day. And then he runs up the mountain again. He doesn't do intervals. He doesn't do, uh, he doesn't go to a, a you know, a, a Mondo track and do two uh, hundreds. He's mm-hmm. very specifically training for, for this. And, and that's because if you take a flat runner and you put them on a 30 degree incline, they don't get out of breath first. They say, oh God, my calves are killing me. I, I can't sustain this. I, I, I'm, I'm getting local fatigue and, and that's what's going to make me stop. Or as we've done in a recent, learned in a recent paper, it may be the stimulus to switch to walking. And that by walking, you uh, change the timing a little bit and you change this, probably the, uh, the angles that the range of motion at, of the uh, calf muscles. Um, and so by all, our working hypothesis, Jackson's, Jackson Brill's working on this for, for his master's thesis, the, the specific question of um, whether, we, whether we switch back and forth for walking and running in an optimal way. But, but anybody who experiences our treadmill or more fun out on a real trail that's super steep um, is that you, you're not necessarily out of breath when you switch to a different gate. It's, it's not the oxygen, uh, delivery is not the only factor. And, um, if the more, the greater oxygen uptake you can sustain for sure, that's going to improve your performance. But if, you know, most of us, it's hard to improve your maximal oxygen uptake, but it is possible to improve your strength improve uh, your flexibility uh, and probably there's some evidence improving your uh, connective tissue um, through specific training for, for uphills. So uh, I think that that's what these uh, Irv, no, it's Urs Zimmerman. That was the guy who I saw the video of the, the cow, the dairy farmer in, uh, in Switzerland, you know, he, he, he's very specifically trained. We, when we did some of these 30 degree studies, we have contacts with a lot of uh, people who can run under 30 for 30 minutes for a flat 10 K and we'd bring them in and they, they, you know, they were not, it wasn't a piece of cake for them. It was, it was brand new and pretty hard for them to, to do. So they had, there were, but then we had Mandy Ortiz's mom, I can't remember her name. Uh, Anita. 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 Yeah. She, um, she's, she lives in outside of Vail and, and, and Eagle County somewhere. And, and she runs a lot on steep uphills and, and she was doing much better on the, uh, on the super steep stuff than the, the flat, uh, fast guys. Um, you know, some of them yeah. were from CU NCA team. Um, yeah. and, and, they could run some very good 10 Ks on the track, but uh, not up a, it, not up a steep thing. So I think that we talked earlier about how practical notes are important for your audience. They're, they're not going to go read, not going to go write an article necessarily. They do read articles, but um, uh, boy, the uphill stuff has emphasized to me how important specificity is. It's, it's, it's such a weird activity that very few of us do on a regular basis. Um, it, 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 it's super important for a steep uphill. Yeah. And so from a practical perspective as a coach, here's what I took away when I saw that research. If, if, If I relate it to a marathon setting, we think about specificity in terms of the bioenergetics and the speed. So if you're going to go run a two hour marathon, two and a half hour mar- marathon, three hour marathon, you have to have the speed specificity to do that. You have to train at those speeds and you have to have the bioenergetic specificity. You have to train at those speeds and at that oxygen uptake, essentially. Sure. I think the, what I took away from that is in the way that it influenced me in the, on the coaching side of it is the specificity component of trail running, running uphill and downhill and up different grades matters even more in that sport discipline. And so when we shift training, as we kind of go along the season, 
as opposed to a marathoner who their training might not really even change all that much in the last eight or 12 weeks on the whole. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you know, okay, we're doing 1200 meter repeats instead of thousand meter repeats or something like that. We think that that's a, like a really marked change, but from a trail running perspective, I almost, I'm going to use the word kind of double down to like make a gross comparison, but I almost double down on the specificity component where it actually becomes so big that you kind of, you almost go out of your way from a training perspective to, to get on those grades and to do everything that you can to train for the different uphills that you're going to encounter on race day. Yeah. And, and there are also, uh, uh, some people make a big deal about running being a skill and, and I can see different sides of that argument, but, um, but for trail running, there are absolutely specific skills that are not innate. And, uh, so one of the things, one of the limitations of our treadmill studies, because we were measuring oxygen consumption is we couldn't, uh, we didn't, people were unable to reach their knees with their hands um, and still have the mouthpiece in because the mouthpiece was sort of fixed. And uh, that's something that, that I do. That's something that lots of us do when you're on a steep hill is you, you bring in accessory muscles, your arms to push, to extend your knees. And, and then I think you said, Nicola, and you talked about the pulse study and, and that's, a, that's just a, a more efficient tool to, to use your, to spread the effort out to your different arms, but it's not easy, right? It's, it's using, using poles while running is, is a, is definitely a skill. Yeah. And, and that was a limitation of his study was finding enough people who were skilled at using poles on, on, uh, uh I should say our study. Cause we, we, we co I co-authored on that one. <laughs> um, my, my main contribution was correct, uh, converting, uh, Italian English to American English. <laughs> but, uh, uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he's a great scientist and, and, uh, and his English is excellent, but, uh, not, not, it's, it's not as easy for him to write as it is for me in English. So he was really, he was really good and very gracious. Uh, you should, you should listen to it afterwards. Yeah. It came out last, last week as we were recording okay. this. Um, uh, he was very nervous about his spoken English in, in advance and it, it, tur it turned out great. But yeah. one of the things that we discussed in that, that is, that I think is really related to some of the things you're finding on the steep treadmill, just in running, uh, in running, uh, scenarios and, it's coupled with this notion that running economy or locomotion economy may not be as important in an mm -hmm. uphill setting is there are conditions where it is very steep and you're, you're, you're using poles where your economy is actually worse, but you might actually perform better because of these other aspects yeah. that are going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. Um, I mean, ideally, and, and on average, Nicola found that poles did improve the, the economy, but they were not running. They right. were, they were walking. So, uh, and, and, and it was really steep too. It was he, so <laughs> I can't, I can't remember. Uh, so ours, definitely our treadmill was for sure the steepest in the world for a while. And then he built his, and I think, I think, uh, his is, uh, his definitely can go to 45. So I think we're, we're sort of, uh, matched, you know, there's, there's two that are equally steep, uh, and, 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 and you can't, you really can't go, you can't walk or run above 45 degrees. It's, it's just, uh, ridiculous. So yeah, even for us, it's ridiculous. Well, and that's one of the things, I mean, one of the blessings that you have in Boulder there is you have a lot of really good athletes that can come in and they can actually try to run. Yeah. on these steeper grades, whereas a mere mortal like myself or you, it's like, there's no chance, even right. at the slowest of speeds or even, yeah, even at the slowest of speeds, we'd be, we would be walking. Yeah. But let's get back to, I, I'm sorry, I diverged. It's fun talking yeah. with you, but, uh, we want to convey some information to your listeners at least. Um, so optimizing economy is critical for a flat, you know, attempt at two hours or two fifteen for the marathon or whatever. Um, absolutely critical. Um, but, and, and I hold can't on, hold, hold on, hold on. Let, let's like really quickly go over why that's so critical. Like why is optimizing economy in a road marathon? Cause we hear about this all of the time, like how important right. running economy is. Why is it so important in a road marathon setting? Okay. So it's, uh, uh, 
econ running economy is the rate of oxygen consumption that a person consumes at a specified running speed. So let's make it Iliad Kipchoge. It, it, for him to run at 21 kilometers an hour or six meters a second, um, he, let's say he uses uh, 60 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, right? And that's the percent, that's a percent of his VO2 max that he can sustain for two hours. Uh, I'm a little off on my numbers because he's probably about 80 for max and 60, 80, but, but you, you get the idea. So let's just yeah. use number 60 because it's a nice, easy number. So if, um, if we could do something for Elliot so that he only required 59 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute to run at that speed, then he wouldn't still run at that speed. He'd say, oh, I can go a little bit faster, a certain you know, 0.1 meters per second faster and be at that sustainable 60 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. So if you become more economical, it allows you to run at the same effort, but at a faster speed. So that's why it's, uh, that's why it's so critical. Okay. And in, in addition to that, in a high performance setting, especially at the marathon, they're running at such a high percentage of their VO2 max. Yeah. There's nothing, there's like, you can only, you know, it's the estimates are anywhere between 85 and 90% of their VO2 max. Yep. There's nowhere else to go. Oxygen, oxygen is at such a premium. If you can reduce the cost of locomotion, yep. and like you said, they're still going to run it 87% or 89%. You just reduce mm -hmm. the cost. Right. You, or, or you maintain the cost, but it allows you to go at a faster speed. Yeah, so exactly. if, if, if that's your performance metric, which it is in a flat marathon is how fast you can do it. Okay. Um, then th that's absolutely uh, the, the critical variable. Okay. okay. I, and I wanted to go over that because that once again, not, not, not a lot of, uh, of the lay audience will be very familiar with it, but I, I think that because it's become so important in marathon running, we've automatically correlated it to ultra marathon and trail running. Yep. And I don't think that correlation correlation in the data shows this yep. is quite as tight. And so that was going to be your next step. So now you got the floor again. <laughs> okay, sure. So I can't think of any situation for flat uh, level marathon, uh, level marathoning where you would there's any advantage to doing something that worsens your running economy. I just, there's, there just isn't anything. Uh, <clears throat> the only extreme might be in temperature. No, even temperature, it's going to be better to, uh, to be more economical because you'll produce less heat. So um, it's, but let's, let, there are situations on steep terrain or longer distances where you want it, you could, you, you should probably sacrifice uh, the running economy, uh, because it's not the limiting factor. So if, uh, it, in a 800 meters after an 800 meters, most of the runners are, are bent over. They're holding their knees. They got their hands on their knees. They're just like, they're completely out of breath. It's very clear that entered that the, the rapid delivery of oxygen and, and the, they're maxed out their, uh, their glycolytic, uh, and, and, uh, uh, so-called anaerobic system, not so-called anaerobic systems are maxed out, right? Um, that's not the case. When you get to the top of a, of a really steep uh, mountain, uh, if it's not at extreme elevation, uh, it's, that's, not, that's not why you are, are slowing down. It's not that you're completely out of breath in every situation. Sometimes it's that your calves are burning. Sometimes it's... Uh, 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 that your quads are burning. It's, it's, it's not always the case um, that, that you're so much out of breath, but you just don't have the, the, local, uh, the localized endurance of the muscles to do it. And so that gets back to the poles. One of the ways to get around the local calf limitation or quad limitation is to use accessory muscles. And uh, it may take a little bit more oxygen. It, it almost in many situations, it does take more oxygen to use, use your arms rather than your legs. Um, but uh, your legs are not burning out. If you can, if you can spread the effort out to a greater muscle mass, uh, that, can, that can enhance performance. Um, and, and we actually know from 
really kind of not boring, but uh, not at all athletic events in the laboratory is if we have a person ride a, a stationary bicycle that they pedal with their legs at 50 watts, and then we give them a hand ergometer, they use a lot more energy to, to move the, the hand ergometer at the same power output. So our arms are not as efficient at, at doing, uh, doing work, but um, it, it's a, it's a, it's benef it can be beneficial to use poles because you spread the effort out uh, to different muscles. And it, and it may be also, well, we know that it is. Um, on steep terrain, people switch between a walk and a run uh, at a certain speed. And we know that one gate, except for where they, they, they cross over, many times people are choosing to alternate between a walk and a run, even though running uses more energy. Um, on a steep incline, up in, uh, for almost everybody who's listening to your podcast, um, up a really steep incline uh, beyond about 15 degrees, walking is going to use less oxygen. Okay, but <clears throat> at the same at the same speed. So, um, but we don't always. And and if you watch a race, you watch a video of a race. It's not that everybody is walking continuously but they're alternating between walking and running. And uh, that's, that, that's a, a really nice uh, magnifying glass on this question that you raised. Do you always optimize economy? And the answer is no. In, uh, in, in situations like steep trail running, steep, it probably is true for running up the Empire State Building too. Uh, steep, uh, steep locomotion, you, can, you alternate gates triggered by local fatigue factors, by, by calf muscles is where our focus has been lately. We think that it's the, uh, the calf muscles. And th so this question is gonna be fascinating to a number of, to a, a to the listeners, but anybody who's just picking up this podcast for the first time, because they all have the experience of being in a race or being in their local training run and everybody's going uphill and half the people around them are walking and half are running, but they're all going the same speed yeah. and they all have different respiration rates, right? Yeah. So their heart rates are different. The rate of respiration is different. And I'm sure if we could take, you know, a magic magnifying glass and look at this localized fatigue that you were just mentioning, especially mm -hmm. at the calf, that would look markedly different as well. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've looked at it in the lab where we have people, we set the speed, we set the incline, we put, um, uh, electrodes on the skin surface above their muscles. We measure what's called electromyography, and uh, and we can see that um, th there's a lot of there are really some important differences between walking and running on steep incline. And and one is that it's uh, uh, even though you don't leave the ground uh, on, during steep uphill running, it's still running. It's bounce. It's a bouncing movement. Okay, and um, I think everybody. Uh, many of your listeners will know that when you run, your step frequency is, is faster. And that's a pretty clear, uh, uh, dis discrete change. You know, you, you're walk, 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 run, 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 walk, walk, walk. It, it, it's, a, it's not a gradual, you don't gradually change your frequency when you change gates. And, and humans don't, don't blur the gate. They, it's you, you, if you, if we ask our subjects, are you walk? We say, would you please walk, or would you please run? They 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 don't have any hesitation. They they quickly switch they you know to a faster frequency when we ask them to run, and um, so so there are important differences. And what that may do at the local fatigue level, we don't have super good evidence or uh, of this, but um, we'd like to, um, is it may affect blood flow. So if you are uh, running, there's less time uh, in between contractions of your calf muscles. All right. Um, and, in, uh, and in walking, there's a longer swing phase. There's a longer time where your, your, your muscles are not active. And that may be important for reducing uh, or, or minimizing the, fatigue, the local fatigue is uh, allowing the blood to uh, reperfuse the muscle. Because when you're when you're sorry, I used one of those uh, twenty dollars words. Uh, perfused means uh, <laughs> allow blood flow. So if you are contracting your calf muscles and and your foot's on the ground uh, in a run, 
uh, the blood's not getting to your muscle for that time when the muscle is contracted. Uh, it, it's just not able to overcome the, the, the physical pressure of the muscle contraction. So the blood is kind of surging into your muscles when your foot's not on the ground. And um, we, uh, I say we, this is probably just me. I think that uh, an active, a, a good area of uh, research would be to look at blood flow, the pulsatile nature of blood flow in, in walking versus running. Um, I don't really even know how to do that, but there are things called Doppler flow. Uh, there, there are devices that can measure blood flow in uh, from the outside. So let's hypothesize this for just one second. Okay. So if part of the advantage of switching from a run to a walk is that the way that you're using the muscles is so markedly different. And part of the way that that <laughs> shows up, as you mentioned, your, is your cadence. So some of the practice that I see, I don't necessarily agree with this, but some of the practice that I see out with trail runners is they want to increase their walking step frequency to hmm. the extent that they're trying to match or get as close to their run step frequency as possible, because that's the form of locomotion that they're the most used to. And when I look at that and knowing this, this localized fatigue phenomenon that's happening that might be alleviated by switching between those two modalities. I say, no, I actually want it to be different. I don't want to try to contrive yeah. the walking modality to be close to the running modality because there's something within switching between walking and running that is beneficial to performance. That's a total hypothesis that I've had yeah. just coming yeah. up with the research. But what, so what do you think about it? Having been a part of all this? Yeah, that's, uh, we have not done that experiment. It would, uh, uh, well, maybe I can't say we, but uh, she, she turned out to be my PhD student, but a, a woman named uh, Chris, uh, Christine Snyder was a, a master's student uh, here at Colorado with my, uh, my wife, Claire Farley, and they did a study of uh, uphill running, uh, really modest inclines by the standards we've been talking about today. Um, but they had people run at different frequencies on an incline. And just like we do on the level, people chose and found their uh, energetically optimal uh, stride frequency in running. Um, I don't know of anybody who's done that. Uh, it's been done for walking as well on the level. Um, and on the level, people choose, uh, they find their optimal step frequency for walking. And so I don't think uh, it's a pretty small uh, uh, logical step to think that that's also the, going to be the case for uphill walking. And that um, I think that may be a, that may be a, a, not a good, good way to spend your training time. Uh, I, that would be my guess. You may be able to switch the optimum right. to a faster frequency. Right. The body may adapt to that, but I don't think that it's going to be a lower optimum. It's not going to be a, it's not going to save energy. Um, the, I, I mentioned earlier, well, you mentioned earlier that I've studied a lot of animals and, um, and I just recently, I said that in, in, I specified in humans and, and that is that humans use discrete gates and don't blur them very much. Um, and, and that's true of in most situations for animals, but we, we found, uh, my wife, uh, Claire Farley, was a scientist uh, we, we met in the lab and so on. Anyhow, she's done a lot of locomotion experiments back in the, you know, but not for the last 15 years because she, she had health problems. But anyhow, Claire, um, we were interested in why horses and why and dogs, why four-legged animals switch between gates. And the first thing uh, we did was we put a little weight vest on the, on the dogs. And um, what the dogs did was they, we, we used the word slur. They kind of, they blurred the gait distinction. They, 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 they continued to trot, but it was not like the way they were trotting without the weights. Yeah. The horses, the ponies, when we put weights on them, they immediately uh, switched to a gallop and spread the force out over uh, more legs uh, at a time. Um, but, uh, but the horses, I don't know. I, I don't know whether it's all training and selection or what, but horses are very discrete 
they choose it's either this gate or that gate, yeah. this gate or that gate. There's no in between. But dogs, and I suspect some other uh, four-legged animals, perhaps smaller four-legged animals, um, blur that gate distinction. And it and it may be for a good reason. Um, I don't know. Um, and it may be trainable. You know, if if you take your dog backpacking, sometimes people can't have the dog carry uh, some extra load, um, and they may adapt to it. Um, but boy, I don't think I don't I can't see the advantage of uh, I can see a disadvantage of using a high step frequency in walking, and that is that um, when you're when you're walking, your leg is relatively straight, and advancing it, swinging that leg forward. Um, that internal work to swing your leg forward is going to go up dramatically if you increase the, the frequency. So, uh, boy, I'd be very surprised if that was advantageous. Yeah, um, I keep coming back to this strategy. Uh, and I used to be a, a form wonk, you know, mm -hmm. in my early coaching days where we'd look at, you know, slow motion, you know, tapes and try to... Yep you know, okay, let's try to optimize your foot placement and all this other stuff. And a lot of that is my track and field background, like working with sprints and jumps and hurdles and stuff like that, where that type of technique is actually really, really valuable. But I keep coming back to in a, in a running situation. I don't try to change much unless it's really egregious. Um, I just don't, I don't even mess with it because, you know, there's always that, there's always that period that they're worse. We know that much, whether or not they can get better. I, it just don't, it's, it's not consistent, I guess is what I'm saying. It's like, sometimes they get worse and they stay worse. Sometimes they get worse and they might get a little bit better. Yeah. I, I, I have a very well-equipped laboratory still. And, and yet the sensors that uh, we have in our body are, are substantially better than the, uh, and the processing power that we have for those sensors are, is still substantially better than, than uh, what we have technologically. But but let's go back to this person or or this uh, these people who are training for uh, uh, high step frequency in walking. I, I think they may be onto something, in, and that is that runners don't train for walking very much. Yeah, and and uh, that makes a lot of sense if you're uh, Iliad Kipchoge or uh, Galen Rupp or somebody who wants to run a ten thousand meters or uh, a marathon at which is at a crazy fast pace. But, um, but if you know that you're going to do a hundred K or a hundred mile or, or, or what, or a very steep, even a, you know, a 15 K that's got a lot of steep terrain. Um, it seems like we should be going out for a walk rather than going out, say we're going out for a run. I mean, you could still say to your friend, Oh yeah, I'm going running, but don't run, right. <laughs> <laughs> go, go to a steep, uh, a steep hill and, and, and train that walking. It, it comes back. Um, you know, I, I can't help but be a professor, even though I'm retired. Right. And, and the biggest thing I, I did the same thing when I was a student, but the biggest mistake that students do is they study what they already know. They have a test coming up and they're like, Oh, well, this is, I like this stuff. I'm going to study this stuff. And it's like, you already know that stuff. What you should be studying and working on is your weakness. Mm -hmm. And athletes don't, we're, we're, we, we do the same thing, right? We say like, ah, oh, I really like long gradual runs in the forest. I, I, I hate going and doing intervals. <laughs> and, and yet that may be that working on your weakness is, um, is probably the smartest use of your training time. Uh, yeah. it, it's where there's the, there's the most potential for gains and, uh, and yet very few people train for, for uphill walking, for steep uphill walking. And, and yet that's, that's, you get the time that you can gain on the uphills, uh, is, is huge compared to the time that you can gain on the, on the level or, or even, even more so the downhill. But I, I think downhill training is, is uh, specificity of downhill training is, uh, is, is super important. We haven't, we haven't done much on downhill running in my lab, I have to admit. Well, and the, the uphill uh, component of it or the walking component of it, I always have a hard time uh, getting, getting buy-in with athletes on that because they think it's too easy. But hmm. what, I, what I do is I just show them how much they're going to be walking during a particular race. And most of the time they're 
absolutely flabbergasted. It's on the order of five or even 20 fold what they thought. And the exercise that I take them through, I'm like, okay, how much do you think you're going to be walking during whatever? Leadville Trail 100, yeah. Western States, whatever. And they say, ah, oh, maybe an hour or something like that. And then it ends up being like eight or 10 or 12, wow. depending upon the speed hours. They're, com they're completely wrong. And so that's the first step that I take. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm trying to organize right now, maybe I can cajole some enterprising master student out there to help me out with this mm -hmm. is to see how much running and walking there is across different finisher times for some of these major ultra marathoners. I have that data set in my, you know, in my wheelhouse, because mm -hmm. it's something that I, that, that I track a lot, but I don't have it outside. So I can't, you know, I can, it's my own end of one. Yep. But most people, when I go through that exercise with them are just absolutely stunned at how much walking they're actually doing, particularly at the, at the hundred mile distance. And then we translate it into training because I, you know, you and I have gone through this before with the previous edition of the book, I view it as different, almost different sports, right? They're connected by the cardiovascular system, but the way that the human moves mm -hmm. through the trail is markedly different. Yeah, it it's it, you monitor the gait with uh, from Cadence, so you can you yeah. can look yeah, at their, look at their Garmin. That. No, I think that's a perfectly good. Uh, in, in fact, it it may be yeah. We're, that's what uh, Jackson uh, and I are are using for his master's thesis. We're yeah. we're not using a, a, a wrist. We're using a, a an inertial measurement unit at the at the hip um, at the waist, and I think that might be a little bit better, but. Um, it gets it close enough. Like, of absolutely. course, you don't have absolutely. all the data, but if you just draw a line, you're know, like, okay, yeah. everything above here is running. And I actually have a piece of software that'll do that for me. I can say everything above here is running and everything below here is walking. Mm -hmm. And in all, I cannot, I can't, oh, throughout my entire coaching career, I've never had one situation where an athlete walked too much in training. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll use the word power hike because that's what trail runners like as opposed right. to walking. <laughs> yes. Where they have done that too much in training and yet everybody does it does running too much in training. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh yeah if I think the math is a good way to do it because if you could improve uh if you could reduce their walking time uh the their speed during the walking phase by 10 percent or five percent it's, it's a huge number of minutes, right? And, and yet, uh, you know, imagine a triathlete. It's, it's, al it's almost like a triathlon, right? Yeah. You, could you, ima a triathlete who didn't train for swimming uh, would, be, would do terribly, right? They'd, they'd give up so much time in the swim um, and, and an, ultra, an ultra, see, we can't call it an ultra power hike, but an ultra <laughs> marathon, <laughs> An ultra, an ultra locomotion uh, is, is the same thing. If you don't train for the walking part, it's as dumb as not training for swimming in a triathlon. Yeah, 100%. Okay, we, we, we digress there a whole heck of a lot. Yeah. We're, just, we're just totally fine and really, and, and really fun. Okay, so you've now passed on the lab and the tools contained within the lab to another fine group of individuals and kind of with your, the legacy that you have largely uh, created there, they're, they're in very good hands. I know there's a zillion things in your head of problems that you want to solve mm -hmm. and you only have, we all only have a limited amount of time on this earth. What do you think the, the steep treadmill, where do you want it to go in the next few years? Like what problems can we solve that are specific to trail and ultra runners there? Um, well, uh, literally it's going to go to the university of Massachusetts. So, uh, I'm going to give it to my former postdoc, uh, Walter Hogkammer, who uh, has done a lot of, uh, we've collaborated on a lot of running studies in recent years, and he's just starting as an assistant professor. So, uh, that's where it's uh, physically going to go. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have some other, I was talking earlier about how tools are important and, um, and we have emerging better and better tools for studying local fatigue. So um, one of these you're, you, you and your readers or uh, your listeners may be familiar with is, uh, is uh, inf uh, uh, MERS, uh, infrared spectrom, intra infrared spectrom, spectrom, 
spectrometry. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, this I'm is glad you got tied up at least once because I do that a dozen times. Yeah. So um, uh, I think these mirror sensors are, I, I know they're getting better. I just saw a paper by a, a physiologist uh, uh, who I really respect, Michael Joyner, his group. Um, is using these to uh, to estimate blood flow and and to measure oxygenation of uh, local uh, in local muscles, and um, we've also so that's a that's a really important tool that that is going to uh, expand. The other tool that um, I saw I saw probably in uh, like 1995 was uh, ultrasound, uh, small sensors that can go on the muscles and measure the actual length change of the muscle fibers during an activity. And um, those work remarkably well for superficial muscles, like the ones that are most critical here. The, the gastrocnemius and the soleus is the, are, are the key muscles and where this, this technique works really well. Um, so understanding what the muscle fibers are doing in the different gates um, those are two tools. A third tool, uh, we've used conventional electromyography, EMG, which involves putting two relatively big electrodes, kind of like heart rate electrodes on the muscle, or on the skin over the top of the muscle. And that's probably um, equivalent to going out uh, in a shopping mall and saying, asking two people who they're going to vote for and and can conclude that uh, there that's that's a good survey right it's it's and, and so we know this we know that electro conventional electromography has not been uh, it doesn't tell us everything that we want to know and um, there are grid electrodes now my colleague Roger Anoka uh, has adopted these uh, wholeheartedly and it and it, it instead of just having two electrodes over the skin over a muscle he'll have a you know a hundred electrodes and be able to, uh, to uh, get a much more representative picture of what the muscle fibers are, uh, what the activity of the muscle fibers are. So, so I think those are new tools that will be, uh, will be really helpful. Um, but what you I think the, you know, the, the questions, common, the is, common theme between all of those is local is it's a more intimate view of what's going on at the neuromuscular level, muscular yeah. and or neuromuscular level. Right, and 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 it's localized yeah. because uh, that that's the um, <clears throat> that's that's I think that's where there's a lot of action. Um, but the second thing that we haven't done uh, that I'd like to, I would have liked to, I don't know, maybe I'll get to collaborate with some with Valter on this, is um, is the trainability of uphill economy. So we there is not very there's weak evidence and, and mostly evidence to the counter that you can, a person can improve their running economy on level ground by a substantial amount. Okay. They're, the best counter example is Paula Radcliffe and, and Andrew Jones in the UK studied Paula Radcliffe from, uh, I believe she was like 16 until 35 or something like that. And she did improve her running economy over that long period of time. And, and I think that's probably true um, based on our, our, we've studied really older people, people over 65 and their running economy is not, is not worse. If they've been lifelong runners, their running economy, uh, and, and there's every reason to think that it should be worse, but it's not. So I think that it's probably, it is getting worse, but it's getting better at the same time. So it looks the same, right? It's, it's the aging process is not pretty. But um, but running economy stays about constant. So so that's what I was saying about level. I don't think there's a, uh, it's not easy to change your running economy on the level by a substantial amount. There's some marginal gains, but we know that these people like Urs Zimmerman and other vertical kilometer specialists, uh, it's not that they have the highest VO2 max in the world, and it it certainly is something that they have very specifically trained their, their muscles for uphill locomotion, but the end result may be that they are more economical uh, at the specific scale of, of running up steep hills. Um, we didn't find that at more, uh, my uh, grad school roommate, Tim Briner and, uh, and I published a paper mm. 
25, I think it was 25. It might've been 30, 30 years after the data were collected and we had both retired uh, and we published his, his master's thesis data. And that showed that uh, if you take an average, uh, you know, recreational runner who runs uphill, downhill level, just without specifically thinking about it, um, it's not that there are people who are specifically economical downhill runners or specifically economical uphill runners. But I think that if you take, if you, if we looked at some people, uh, either uh, it'd be easier to do as a cross-sectional just to look at first, and that is to get some really elite vertical kilometer athletes and see what their running economy is on steep inclines. And I bet that it's, I bet that it's better. Um, and, uh, and then the, the follow-up study would be to, uh, take someone who's, who you're converting from a, a level runner to a mountain runner and, and monitor their, uh, their uphill economy over, over a, a training year, uh, at least a year and see if, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you could do it more intensively. You might be able to do it in, in eight weeks, just if they were focused on improving their, uh, uphill running economy. Um, so what would your hypothesis be that it's more trainable? Well, pro I mean, probably be more trainable in the flat condition. If you're saying the flat condition isn't trainable at all, or it could go down, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have a great explanation for it, but there's pretty strong evidence from a num number of groups now that plyometric training yeah. can improve run a level running economy. Yeah. And um, I would say that, although we typically think a plyometric is jumping off of a box and uh, down and back up, um, I think that probably uphill running is, is, a, is a pretty similar to a plyometric, uh, kind of training, um, because you are still bouncing. Um, and, and that, so I think that the strength, um, the, the muscle fibers are adapting to, uh, operating at the, uh, at an optimal length, um, and the connective tissue may be adapting as well. Um, I, I, I can't really. It's hard to get too far along speculating on a mechanism, but I think I think it's worth. I think that would be. I would pursue that. That would be a, if I was a master's student out there listening to this uh, podcast. Um, that that's that's a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Looking at the trainability of a very specific locomotor task, a, a novel right. uh, uh, locomotor task. So the, we, the hard thing you always have with those types of studies is the novelty of it, right? Yeah. Because you have to find enough subjects where that locomotor task is not novel yep. so that the trainability kind of fuddles with whatever else you're measuring. So maybe, maybe uh, I should, I'm sure I suspect that Valter Hochammer will, will listen to this at some point. And uh, Valter, <laughs> uh, Valter's from, uh, he was born in the Netherlands. And I think that might be what you should do is, is, uh, take a group of people who train in the Netherlands where there's zero hills except for the bridges over the canals uh -huh. Uh -huh. and, and take them to the uh, French Alps for eight weeks and, and, and run hills. Uh, or maybe even in Belgium, you could go to the Ardennes. There are some hills there, but um, I think, uh, and you may even be able to train them on a treadmill. Uh, I mean, I don't think that's, uh, that, that, that would be a quite reasonable. The, the advantage of a treadmill for steep uphill running is that you don't have to run downhill. Yeah. And so if you're trying to not injure someone, um, you know, uh, but, but then again, you, you can't, if you're going to run downhill in a race, you have to train downhill or else you're going to get hurt in the, as in the course of the race. So, yeah. but, um, yeah, I think you, you would want to, I think you're right to stack the deck. You want to get people who ne hardly ever run up a hill. <laughs> and uh, the, the study that Tim Briner and I did, that Tim did, that I helped him write up, uh, uh, was in central Pennsylvania, which is, is about as mixed as you can get. It, it, there's, there's, it's, not up, it's not really mountainous, yeah. but it's not flat. It's, it's just rolling hills, basically. Yeah. And uh, so people... Those people were uh, perhaps the most generalist. You know, they 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 were used to some uphill running, but not extremes, and and but they weren't solo flat runners, solely flat runners. Yeah. yeah. My my speculation on that is 
and this is pure speculation. I can make pure speculation because I'm not a scientist and I can be wrong and I can be like, eh, you know. Oh, <laughs> but, we're, we're wrong all the time. <laughs> but uh, my, my speculation on the adaptation part of that is that it's very rapid. I mean, hmm. if you took a, a runner from the Netherlands and you brought him over to the Alps and you saw how their economy and or their performance and mm -hmm. uphill conditions changed, my my hypothesis would be it would be kind of like an asymptotic curve, right? Where mm. where it improved very quickly early on and then sort of leveled off. Mm -hmm. And the what where I'm coming to that from, or the rationale, the mechanistic rationale behind that is that the initial uh, the 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 initial driving force behind those adaptations are neuromuscular, and mm -hmm. we know that those adaptations are relatively quick to yep. happen, as opposed to the cardiovascular ones, like all the stuff that we talk about in typical endurance physiology, those take months and sometimes sure. years to, to, to pull off. And we see it a little bit in practice where we take runners that are from like the Midwest or they don't have a lot of elevation gain or elevation loss. And then we do a training camp with them in the Sierras or in the Rockies or whatever. And they get markedly better after just mm -hmm. one or two weeks and they're able to handle the elevation gain and elevation loss of whatever particular race. Yeah, uh, you're you're probably right. Uh, uh, everything is uh, diminishing returns in yeah. training, right? Yeah. You get you get the big bang right away. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. All right, this is fun. I really appreciate it. We're gonna sure. let you go. Um, I don't have any. Normally, I ask people like, where can they follow you? But I feel like you just want to go off into the mountains and go run and hike and things like that. <laughs> oh, uh, well. I yeah, I, they, they, uh, I'm on Twitter, um, but it's uh, not a tremendously high percentage of science on Twitter. It's more uh, sarcastic comments about uh, uh, world events and uh, things. But uh, 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 whenever we publish a paper, a new paper, I always put it up on Twitter. So maybe that's uh, worthwhile. They, people would have to uh, uh, put up with my uh, uh, other comments. So. Uh, people are used to that now. You did have a few good zingers, though, uh, during Nike's Breaking 2 project and the Enios 159 project. I give you total credit for, for those code out because that did not come without controversy. That's not something that we talked about on this podcast, but I know <laughs> that it was something that caused any gray hairs that you had left to become gray. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I have uh, stuck my finger in the electrical socket on a couple of issues in in recent decades. So the Oscar Pistorius was uh, uh, was one of those, and uh, and the, uh, the the Vaporfly shoes was the second, and and then two hour marathon was a was a third. But uh, um, uh, I've been lucky enough to to be at the right place on those, and and uh, they, you know they're they they are in my opinion, historic, uh, points in the, in the history of running. So, uh, and, and certainly history of running science. So I've been lucky to be at there. So those, those, uh, uh, crossroads. That's a perfect way to bring it full circle, Roger, because one of the more influential, uh, pieces of impact that you've had on me is when you brought a lot of the stuff from the Oscar Pistorius trial into the undergraduate class yep. of yours that I attended. And I knew at the time, because I was an older undergraduate student, that that would not, that that could have come with a little bit of controversy because of where it was at the state. But I appreciated it as a student mm -hmm. and as a lover of history of track and field sports that you're able to do that. And so I would encourage you and other scientists out there to keep sticking your fingers in electrical sockets because it's entertaining. It brings people to the table. And ultimately, if it makes people think, it's going to yeah. make our understanding of everything better. Yeah, it, it really, sometimes these things really focus our thinking. Absolutely. All right, All right. That's a good place to leave it. Thanks, Roger. Appreciate it. Bye, Jason. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Roger for coming on the podcast today. Hope everybody got something out of that particular podcast to better meter your uphill efforts. Thank you to all the listeners out there. I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you. And if you think that you are a good candidate for coaching, you want to 
raise your game up another level for any of your summer endeavors, go ahead, hit me up on social media. I would love to connect you with one of our coaches or maybe I'm the right coach for you and I'll coach you myself. Information on all of that is in the show notes as well as information on some of the more recent research that Roger uh, has recently produced. That's it for today, folks. As always, we will see you out on the trails.